I'm Ryan Kroll, journalist and interviews editor for Boulevard Magazine. For more information about Boulevard, check out our website at boulevardmagazine.org. On behalf of the St. Louis County Library, HEC Media, and Boulevard Magazine, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's virtual author interview with novelist Emily St. John Mandel. Emily is the author of five novels, including the National Book Award nominee, Station Eleven, and her new novel, which is now out in paperback, The Glass Hotel, was selected by Barack Obama as one of his favorite books of 2020. And it was one of my favorite books of 2021. And you can buy that today at Left Bank Books. So Emily, without any further ado, welcome and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've read in previous interviews that you've sort of struggled to kind of summarize or give an elevator pitch about what the Glass Hotel uh, is, is about. But I'm wondering um, for folks who are maybe familiar with your previous work, but haven't gotten around to reading The Glass Hotel yet, could you, as best you can, kind of try to uh, summarize the, the book and what it's interested in? Sure, absolutely. Um, to start with, though, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, The Glass Hotel has been evading my attempts at an elevator pitch for like three years. But what I've been going with lately is that uh, The Glass Hotel is a mystery. Uh, a massive Ponzi scheme collapses in New York City. Ten years later, a woman disappears from the deck of a container ship, and those two events are related. So it's a mystery, it's about financial crime, and it's also a ghost story. And one of the sort of primary interests of the book is what you refer to or what your characters refer to as the kingdom of money, basically this uh, part of society where these very rich people, whether they're in New York City or London or Singapore, it's always kind of the same for them. The, the, the feel, the experience of life uh, has very little variety. And I'm wondering, could you just maybe talk a little bit more about how you thought about that idea, both um, in the construction of the novel and also just maybe how it impacts or how it exists in our real life? Sure, absolutely. So I grew up very working class and I have no complaints. It was a great upbringing, but we really didn't have money. And then in adult life, when I found myself kind of for the first time spending time with people who hadn't grown up working class, who'd grown up middle class, or even with quite a bit of wealth, it began to seem to me that we were fundamentally from different countries in a way that has nothing to do with the Canada-US border. You know, I grew up in Canada and now I'm here uh, in the United States. But it seems to me that the socioeconomic level on which you grow up, that it kind of gives you its own culture, you know, in terms of the way you expect the world to work, the things you expect of the world as you move through life. And I don't mean any of this in any kind of derogatory way. You know, some of my very favorite people grew up with a lot of wealth, but it's just interesting as a cultural difference. So I was sort of mapping that experience onto the book because I was thinking about it. The starting point for the book was that I was just going to focus it very narrowly around this massive financial crime, which although every character in the book is fictional, the crime is based on Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme, which of course collapsed in 2008. And then I realized that if you're writing about a financial crime, you're kind of writing about money by default. So that became an organizing principle in the construction of the book. I thought, well, every section of the book, maybe every section of the book should relate in some way to money. So the kingdom of money was this idea I had, where, which is maybe best explained by anecdote. So about six months before the pandemic, I think it was October 2019, I was spending a lot of time in Los Angeles for a screenwriting project I'm involved in. Because the book tour for my previous novel was epic. I had a ton of air miles saved up on Delta Airlines. So on two occasions, I used my stash of air miles to upgrade to first class for the return flight from Los Angeles back home to New York. So what that looks like in practical terms is your plane takes off from Los Angeles at 10.30 p.m., something like that. You recline your seat to 180 degrees. It turns into a comfortable bed. You pull up this soft duvet, take a very pleasant nap, and then wake up as the plane's landing in New York City like five hours later. And 
the frictionlessness of that experience was kind of disorienting. I remember having this really kind of nonsensical thought, getting off the plane in New York one morning, thinking, you can't convince me these are two different places. Like, it was just like, it was so easy that it kind of erased the distance. And it seems to me that living with an enormous amount of wealth would probably feel that way, that your life would be, I would have much less friction. You know, it would just be this kind of continuously smooth, luxurious experience that would kind of collapse distances between places. So I think that in those conditions, London and New York City would feel like fundamentally the same place. You, you've, you've spoken before um, in other interviews about um, a sort of longing for uh, consensual reality, I think is the term that you yeah. use. Basically, um, you know, a, a, a nostalgia for the days whenever we used to disagree about a common set of facts. Yeah, uh, yeah, I miss to... those days desperately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, likewise, likewise. Um, but it's, and I think that's oftentimes constructed in like a sort of right left kind of paradigm mm -hmm. and, and rightfully so. But in this book, um, there seem to be numerous instances where folks who exist within this kingdom of money, as you say, can no longer even really interface in a meaningful way with people who aren't also in the kingdom of money. I mean, there's, there's many examples of that. And then the one character who I thought was really interesting, um, Jonathan, who is who's the architect of this Ponzi scheme, uh, after it collapses, he, he says something along the lines that, you know, he had never been curious about people before until he found himself in prison with nothing but uh, time to kind of ruminate and, and be alone with his thoughts. So I'm just wondering, can you maybe say a little bit more about kind of that hard barrier that seems to exist between folks in this very rarefied space and, and everyone else? But both, again, like sort of as a societal issue and also as maybe something that sort of propulsed the novel? Yeah, absolutely. I think that barrier goes both ways. I think that if you're struggling to get by and you're having to make choices, like should I buy groceries or pay my rent this month, the lives of people who have it much easier are unimaginable. And I think it's easy to not really see them as people, to kind of see them as like avatars for obscene wealth and like undeserving wastrels or whatever. Um, <laughs> But then, of course, that does go the other way, too. I, I was an administrative assistant for a really long time, up until a year after Station Eleven came out. And I remember having this really interesting experience once where I was working in a cancer research lab, and there was a philanthropist who had funded the lab. So he came to visit one day, and my boss was there. And my boss introduced me as a novelist. So the philanthropist was really interested because he had a daughter studying. She was in the arts. I don't remember exactly where at a university. And, you know, we were talking about the arts. And then another time, a few months later, the philanthropist came back. My boss happened to be out of the office. So he saw me as the admin, which meant he literally couldn't see me. It was fascinating. I took his coat and then his gaze just slid right over me for the duration of the visit. You know, it was... It was like in his world, I was part of the office furniture. And I think that's not uncommon. I think that for people at a really extreme level of wealth, that it probably takes some effort to continue to see people, you know, who just exist in a fundamentally different world from you. And, you know, a lot of people at that level, I think, do make the effort and do actually see people. But it does seem to be an effort. You know, it's kind of, mm -hmm. it's this kind of interesting um, yeah, I mean, it's classism, essentially, when it runs that way. And it, it is a really interesting phenomenon to me. Yeah, yeah. So you, you mentioned, you made very clear um, that all the characters in this book are, are fictional. They're your own creations. But um, the Jonathan Alcatis character was inspired in some ways by Bernie Madoff. Mm -hmm. uh, their Ponzi schemes resemble each other. Uh, and you cited, I think, in the back of the book as the, the nonfiction book, um, The Wizard of Lies, as being very, very helpful. Uh, and it's, it's a fantastic read. Um, but I'm wondering, is there ever a point whenever you're writing a book like this, which does sort of resemble actual events, is there a point when you just, you just don't want to know anything more about Bernie Madoff? You wanted to sort of have a hard cutoff um, in the writing process, and from there, it'll, it'll just be all your imagination? Or was is there never really sort of enough you can get about someone like Bernie Madoff that you, you know, because it's all kind of potential, you know, raw material to be made into fiction. Um, you know, it's, it was so weird researching that crime because I found the crime itself fascinating. The scale was so outrageous. A 65 billion with a B dollar US Ponzi scheme. But 
The flip side of that was once I started reading interviews with Madoff, he just seemed so incredibly uninteresting to me. Like, if you read his prison interviews, they're so self-pitying. It's all about how if only those greedy investors hadn't pushed him to commit fraud, you know, none of this would have happened. They have nobody to blame but themselves, et cetera. You know, this is a guy who was stealing like teachers' retirement savings, like really low. Um, yeah, so I just found him so uninteresting so quickly that at a certain point, it was just like, ugh, get that, get that, yeah, get that guy away from me. Um, so I would say my experience of the research here is that I couldn't get enough of the crime. That was really interesting to me, the way that worked and the way it required the kind of mass delusion that con artists were able to sustain where, you know, there, there's a certain charisma where you want to believe. And that's, that's how you get sucked into the con, you know? Um, so that was really interesting to me, but Madoff was not, <laughs> that guy was really boring. I wanted to ask a question that it's about both the glass hotel and station 11. Um, I, both books have a an ensemble cast, I guess you could say it, it would be hard to say there's one main character in either one. I was wondering, how do you, how do you think about as you're constructing both of those books, the sort of perhaps kind of competing pressures to both be true to a specific character and have them fully realized on their own journey, um, but also sort of acknowledge that the reader is not going to experience them in a vacuum, that they're going to be right. sort of always kind of bounced off of the other characters whose sections come before and after, et cetera. So kind of from a craft point of view, I suppose, can you talk a little bit about how you think about character um, specifically whenever you're writing these sort of um, ensemble novels? Yeah, sure. And, you know, you've just touched on what might be the most important thing for me, which is character development. And that's actually a big reason of, um, of why I enjoy writing these novels with all these different points of view, because it's really interesting from a character development perspective to have a chapter from the point of view of character A, and then the next chapter is from the perspective of character B, but maybe looking at character A. So it's a completely different perspective, maybe a completely different moment in time. And through those multiple points of view, you get a much fuller vision of who all those characters are. So yeah, I do find myself drawn to the ensemble novel. A and you know, I don't see it as a weakness exactly, but I'm not sure that I could just write a linear novel with one protagonist. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of feels outside my skill set. Um, I really enjoy these books with a lot of different people. Normally, with these events, there eventually, you know, there'd be a Q and A. But mm -hmm. since, since we can't do that today, I, I did reach out to a few friends of mine who I know are big fans of your work. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> asked them if they had any questions, and and one of uh, my friends who's a student in a writing program. Um, I think you kind of already touched on this, but I, I know folks who are maybe writers themselves would love to hear you uh, say more. Uh, since your books are non-linear, I guess, how do you sort of manage, uh, her, her question is, how, how do you sort of manage that chronology during the writing process? Do you, she wanted to know, do you write it all in a linear fashion, then chop it all up? Or is it um, all sort of mixed up from the start? She wanted to know more just about the process of you, uh, how you handle those complicated chronologies that are in your, in your writing. Sure. Um, I just kind of wing it, which makes, as you might imagine, for the most unbelievably messy first drafts. <laughs> so something I always like to emphasize is I don't think there's any one right way to write a novel. I have friends who won't sit down and write the opening line until they know how the book's going to end. I've never wanted to work from an outline because I've always been afraid I'd get bored. And I kind of like the possibility of surprise. So I just start writing. I jump wildly all over the book. And the reason why that can be helpful is I'm not sure that I believe in writer's block per se, but I absolutely have moments where I kind of don't know what to do next. You know, so to use Station Eleven as an example, I remember having this point where I'd written three chapters from Jeevan's perspective at the very beginning. And then having this moment of, wait, where was I going with this guy? You know, did I, did I have a plan for this character? But it was fine because I could just set that aside and then go write a couple of Miranda chapters from a completely different point in the book and then figure out how it all goes together later. So that's what I like to do. I like to just kind of jump all over the place. I'm experimenting with the structure through the entire, through the entire process. So yeah, I'm constantly moving stuff around 
at the end of about a year, I have an incredibly messy first draft. Like it is a disaster. <laughs> Nobody ever sees it. Um, so for me, the book really comes together in the revisions. I wanted to ask you a question about the title of the book, The Glass Hotel. Um, you know, not, not so much as a title, but more as sort of like, I guess, like a central image or maybe even like a central metaphor for, for the story. I always think hotels are really, really interesting for a lot of reasons, um, some of which I think are kind of applicable to the story. One is that you have all these different people under the same roof for a night, but they're all, for the most part, anonymous to each other, or mm -hmm. the contact is kind of random and incidental. Another thing that's interesting about hotels is that their whole purpose is to sort of remove any evidence that you were ever there. Like you have, you know, it could have been like the Rolling Stones in the room the night before, or just like an accountant. So, you know, you really, ideally you wouldn't know either way. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what, what was it about this particular hotel that you found sort of apt uh, to not only have as like the title of your book, but also to have as this sort of very, um, you know, beautiful image and very resonant image, which is referred to a lot in, in its pages. So I had a really long promotional tour for Station Eleven when it came out. I was on the road for, this wasn't continuous. I go home for months in between events, but it's about a year and a half of traveling on and off. It was something like, I want to say 114 events in seven countries. So and then I kept on doing these, these paid lectures and like on stage conversations, actually right up until the pandemic. I, I canceled a lecture on March 12th of last year. So that's another way of saying I've stayed in a crazy number of hotels. <laughs> and, you know, at one point, probably while staying at like the best Western next to the expressway in rural Texas, I found myself thinking, well, what would be the ideal hotel if I could imagine my perfect hotel? And it seems to me the ideal hotel. It has that kind of anonymity you were just talking about, which can also be thought of as being a little bit outside of time and space. It's like they're their own worlds, this kind of self-enclosed bubble. Hotels are a place where anybody could have been. And for that reason, they are really useful from a plot perspective. You know, the hotel bar at that place in British Columbia, that's where the bartender can meet the billionaire and the shipping executive. And it's totally plausible that they're all together in the same room. So yeah, they, uh, they are good from a fiction writing perspective for bringing characters together. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe it is one of the few places left where, the, where, where, where someone from the kingdom of money could have a meaningful interaction with a, a, sort of a person like Vincent in, yeah. in the book. Um, okay, another question that I, I solicited from a friend of mine who's a, also a novelist. Um, he, he asked, he said, um, it occurred to him right away in reading Station Eleven uh, that as a writer, you're on a more you're on more intimate terms with your characters, even relatively minor ones, than most writers. Uh, he said, when a new character shows up in a book of yours, uh, they all are already feel deeply understood, and the character's inner life is revealed uh, with a very light touch. So he wanted to know, in short, how do you do it? How do you do, how do you make that how do you make that uh, happen? He, he he worded that much more sophisticated, but that's the heart of his question. How can right. how can he get on your level? Well, thank you so much. I, I really, I really appreciate that. You know, there's no secret. It's just years and years of brute force revisions for me. So, you know, I alluded earlier to my first drafts being a mess, not just from a plot perspective. You know, I, I feel like with my first drafts, the characters are basically placeholders, like, you know, cardboard cutouts. And then for me, you know, I, I just revise the book so many times. And that's where anything that's coherent or good appears is in the revisions. So what happens for me is, you know, I'll be revising. The first round of revisions, you're fixing enormous plot problems. And then as you keep going, you start to get to more refined stuff. Like, who is this character, really? You start to have moments like you know what, I th actually think Paul wouldn't react that way, given how he reacted in this other way, you know, a chapter earlier. It's like you start to refine and move things around. So yeah, it's, um, I feel like the character development, it comes about the same way and at the same time and the same process as, um, you know, prose style or plotting. It's just going over the work a million times. And with, with a minor character like um, Annika in this book, who, who I, I totally agree, feels fully realized, um, even though her, her ink in the book is not as much as many other characters. 
I, one thing I wondered, are there, are there like uh, pages and pages about her just on your hard drive that don't make it into the book? Or is that not something right. that, that you, you uh, do? Um, is, that, is that not something that you do? Um, that's something I sometimes do. Like with Station Eleven, there's that character, Elizabeth, who's the prophet's mother. Sorry, that was like a huge spoiler, but the book came out seven years ago. So whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And she doesn't get a ton of ink in the post-apocalypse. Mm -hmm. But I do have a chapter on my hard drive of her and her son's lives after leaving the airport, which I cut for the sake of velocity and because it felt gratuitously horrific. You know, the book just didn't need it. Um so I do sometimes have that. For Annika, I don't think I ever had very much more than what's there in the book. Yeah, one other thing I, I was wondering about that's a both kind of a Station Eleven and a Glass Hotel question um, is that a, a recurring theme in book the, both of those books is the way that, I guess, art, generally speaking, whether it be photography or graphic novels or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you sort of, you seem, at least the books are interested in kind of the way that those artworks move through time and their cha meaning changes um, over the years. I mean, uh, again, I guess a spoiler alert, a, a graphic novel, which is sort of written for a private audience in Station Eleven, um, pre-pandemic or pre-apocalypse comes to have great importance post-apocalypse. Uh, and in The Glass Hotel, um, the character Vincent makes these very, very short films as a, as a girl or throughout her whole life, but the mm -hmm. ones that she makes as a girl then become part of a her, her brother's um, uh, music performance later on in life. And, and I was wondering that sort of your own book, Station Eleven, has sort of moved through time in a really interesting way as well, that it was written about a pandemic seven years before a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's possible probably to pick that book up and read it now in the same sort of way you might've read it like in 2015 or 2014. So I guess I'm just wondering, like ha have recent events change the way you think about the way that art moves through time or maybe have recent events just sort of confirmed what you already believed about the, the lifespan of a, of a piece of art? You know, I think they've changed the way I thought about it. I remember with Station Eleven, when I was first thinking about what the book was going to be, my idea was I just kind of wanted to fast forward from the present to this post-technological world. So I was thinking, well, the two most horribly efficient ways of doing that would be either a nuclear holocaust or a flu pandemic. And then I thought, well, but if, if it's a holocaust of some kind, that's a war. That's something that immediately becomes dated, given the speed at which geopolitics change. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, well, a pandemic has a kind of timelessness to it. But we were talking at the outset about consensual reality. There's a scene in Station Eleven where flights are diverted to an airport People get off, they all look at the same monitor, playing like CNN, I think, and they all believe what they're seeing. Like That is not plausible in 2020, 2021. You know, we're in this sort of fragmented age of alternate facts. But it was plausible in, you know, when I wrote it, which would have been, call it 2012-ish. Um, so that was a real lesson to me in the way that really all art becomes dated. And, you know, we tell ourselves that we're creating something that won't become dated because we're not specifying like cell phone models, you know, that kind of thing. But you still kind of carry with you the sort of um, weight is the wrong word, but you're, you're looking at the world through the lens of your particular moment. And yeah, it, it sure, it sure shows up. Like it's sure obvious when that moment changes. I know one um, common th theme or, or I guess a thing that I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're probably must be interested in is, is I, uh, the global shipping business, mm -hmm. as, as it sort of makes an appearance in both of your most recent two books. Um, and it is it is very fascinating. Um, and it, it feels very natural to exist in both of the worlds of the Glass Hotel and Station Eleven. But I, I guess I'm just sort of curious, sort of what is it about um, freight global shipping that resonates with you to such an extent that you would uh, have it play such an important part in both of your most recent two books? know that I'd put in a third book, but it, it is really interesting to me. Um, yeah, you know, I just came across this random article in 2009 during the last economic crisis. The title was something like Revealed, the ghost fleet of the reception, of the, of the recession, sorry. 
Uh, I believe the writer's name was Simon Perry. I think it was the Daily Mail. And he was writing about this really strange thing that had happened. So, you know, of course, when there's an economic collapse or downturn, there's less demand for goods because nobody's spending their money um, on, you know, they're not spending their money as much, which means that there's much less movement of goods around the world, which means that shipping companies end up with a crazy overcapacity problem. And there, there isn't like a parking lot for ships. You know, they're meant to just keep moving forever for the lifespan of the ship. So this very strange solution that shipping companies had come up with in 2009 for all this excess capacity is they'd anchored their extra ships, I think it was 100 miles south of Singapore Harbor. So the way that played out in practical terms was the residents of this very small local fishing village stepped outside one night and the horizon was a blaze of light. They described it as something like a ghost city out at sea that had appeared overnight. It was just such an arresting image and it was really interesting. So then I guess that it stayed with me. And then a couple of years later, I was in a bookstore and I picked up this excellent novel by Rose George, a British journalist called 90% of Everything. And that title kind of sums up the situation. You know, um, here in North America, so few things are made here. Almost everything on and around us came to us over the ocean. And I think what interests me is the combination of scale and invisibility, where on the one hand, it really is 90% of everything, but we don't really see shipping, you know, because we don't have to. It's just, you know, your shirt arrives on schedule, your banana arrives in time for breakfast. Um, yeah, so I think it's the invisibility of it that really interests me. But yeah, I don't know that I'd write a third book with shipping to the center, <laughs> as interesting as it's been. I'm wondering in terms of, uh, you know, you've written about pandemics, Ponzi schemes, um, this fascinating ghost fleet of uh, freighter ships 100 miles south of Singapore. In your, in your career now, which has spanned five novels, have there, has there ever been anything sort of from real life that you were just obsessed with really interested and fascinated by, but just couldn't find an avenue in to work it into a, a, a book of yours yet, but that is sort of always kind of um, maybe been like your your white whale or whatever, something you really wanted right. to, to transform into fiction, but it's just resisted it for some reason. That's interesting. Um, you know, I do find myself thinking a lot about the lives of dancers as a topic. I, I was a dancer before I was a writer. And I've somehow never written about that. And I, I don't really know how to approach it. I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, maybe that's the one thing I'd point to. But I would say, you know, a great benefit to writing novels without an outline is that all of your interests can attach to the book. So you can start off writing a book about a Ponzi scheme that becomes a super weird ghost story, for example. <laughs> you know? or, if you're, um, or you can be interested in container shipping and that attaches itself to two successive books. So yeah, I, I feel like most of the things I've wanted to write about, I've just found a way to incorporate them. But yeah, the dance world is probably the one exception. Well, maybe, maybe um, that'll be book number six for us all to look for. I've actually written book number six. It's coming out oh, next oh. year. Yeah, yeah. Maybe book number seven. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I have to ask, is there anything you can like you can tell us about number six? Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited about it. Um, it's called Sea of Tranquility. And it's set mostly on moon colonies. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a very strange sci-fi about interstellar travel and pandemics. And there's a, um, there's a futuristic book tour in it. I'm, oh, uh, I'm wow. Yeah, I'm still working on the elevator pitch for that one too, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I think that, yeah, I think you've got the elevator pitch okay, down. Okay, good, good. Hmm? Beautiful, beautiful. Well, hey, Emily, thank you so much um, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Uh, once again, the book is, is The Glass Hotel. Uh, and I, I really can't recommend it enough to everyone listening and watching this. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. Fantastic. Fantastic.